Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Denied podcast. I'm the host of the episode, Joe Carson, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. And we're always looking to really bring interesting, fun topics with amazing guests. And throughout the years of the episode, we've had some awesome guests. And this is one that I've been waiting for a long time because uh, I always enjoy the conversation. I always enjoy the intellect and I always enjoy uh, some of uh, his, his ideas. Uh, so welcome to the show, Miko. Miko, if you can give the audience a little bit, I mean, most people know who you are, but um, you know, just give us a bit of a background uh, about yourself, some fun facts, and uh, uh, let's kind of can I hear some of your insights. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So for the listeners, my name is Mikko. I'm an old school hacker, <laughs> programmer, reverse engineer, nowadays a public speaker and writer. I've been working in the industry forever. Started programming as a teenager. I sold my <laughs> first commercial programs when I was 17 years old. Reverse engineered my first malware when I was 21. And those of you watching the video, um, some of you know that I always carry <laughs> one of the five and quarter inch floppy disks in my pocket just to remind myself of where I'm coming from, like I do right now. <laughs> And that actually the floppy I have in my pocket right now is actually infected with an, with did, an early virus. Did you have to get a custom suit for that to fit? <laughs> Fun fact, I actually asked my tailor to, to, to make my pockets big enough to fit a five and quarter inch floppy disk. So yes, the answer is yes, that's, that's true. But nowadays I'm a cybersecurity expert. And when, when youngsters or students ask me that, hey, Mikko, how do you, how do you become an expert? My answer is always the same. You pick a field, then you work in the field forever. And eventually mm -hmm. everybody will, will believe that you must be an expert because you've been doing it forever. <laughs> and, and that's what I've been doing. I've I worked through the largest malware outbreaks mm -hmm. in history. I remember, you know, fighting the early boot sector virus episodes as, the, mm -hmm. as these were spreading around yep. the world, like the Stone and the Michelangelos and forms mm -hmm. all the way to first email worms, to first web worms. I remember when Y2K was the huge issue oh, yes. 23 <laughs> years ago. And then the internet revolution as it changed everything. For the last couple of years, I've been spending a lot of time mm -hmm. looking at the intersection of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. I write about this a lot. I had my um, Wiley published my, my my last book international. It's been translated to multiple languages. So I do a lot of um, educating, both in conferences, but also a lot of mm -hmm. private briefings for mm -hmm. boards and leadership teams of companies of all sizes. Fantastic, absolutely. And then just kind of for the audience. Your book is awesome. I really enjoyed it. Um, we, we both we both are sitting with our copies, <laughs> um, and I really you know it really provides a good background. And I enjoy some of your references in, in, in some of the older school you know types of uh, viruses and malware. So you're you're uh, getting old. That's I know I know because when 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 I start knowing, <laughs> I mean um, yeah, my my career started back in the not as early as yours, my little bit after. Uh, for me, it was 93 was where I still got it in the industry. But I wasn't then for me, I wasn't dedicated to security. I was a system administrator, an operator who basically connected computers and did the whole Windows 3.1 to 95 migration, all of those fun, fun times. Yeah. Um, but uh, when you're telling you, you kind of, the, the stories, it always reminds me of also where I came. And I think I do have your autograph on, on, uh, on the punch card. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not, even the, not even the floppy disk, but the punch cards. <laughs> I actually always carry punch cards with me as well. So this Absolutely. is how I, uh, I, I often show youngsters how we used to store information on paper before any of the configuration. Uh, were that, was, yeah. that was the configuration file. <laughs> so that's, it was. And, and, so. and one thing about Windows 3, um, hmm. I, I just posted on X a couple, of, a couple mm. of days ago when I found a piece of early source code I wrote 30 years ago. And this was a really fun mm. project. I had no recollection what it was until I looked <laughs> at the documentation. But you remember before Windows, we had MS-DOS. And in yes, MS-DOS, we had these TSR programs. Remember what mm -hmm. TSRs are? Terminate and stay resident. Say, say it again. Is it... Terminate and stay resident. Okay. Programs you that's not on the top of mind. So I, I remember double space and I remember because that's a TSR. That's a yeah. TSR. So anything okay. you load that runs in the background in MS DOS, mm -hmm. that's a TSR. And then when Windows started to become a thing, you would first boot up MS DOS and then from MS DOS, you would start up Windows. And mm -hmm. TSRs like double space had hard time working underneath Windows. Mm -hmm. um, 
And what we did, because we had an MS-DOS antivirus mm -hmm. product at, at the time, I created this hack where a TSR would detect that Windows is booting and it would change operation and became it would survive mm -hmm. Windows booting up and then continue running inside Windows as a VXD, that's a virtual device driver yep. for Windows 3.1 or 3.11. Mm -hmm. A massive hack but it worked. And the end result was that when you booted up your system, it would scan floppies automatically when you used them to detect boot sector viruses. And if you <laughs> boot it into Windows, it would still do the same thing. It would be able to prevent you from getting mm -hmm. infected as you were using floppies. Really, you know, like low level programming, assembly that's, that's for Windows 3.11. But, but yeah. um, I'm, I'm glad I had the experience and I'm really glad I don't have to do it anymore. Yeah. Anyone who I always admire anyone who's getting into the driver side of development because that is a very uh, you know it's a very focused and dedicated area. It's because um, I worked a lot in the virtualization side and had to deal with a lot of those uh, filter drivers that had the different altitudes oh, yeah. of where they mm -hmm. load and where you've allowed mm -hmm. to load stuff. So, and um, I think we've I always, already lost like fifty percent of the listeners. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I think I think I think they they love history lessons. That's for sure. So. So let's get one, one of the big things I wanted to ask you about is is for this year, you know, in the past year, um, a lot's been happening. You know, we always see, you know, the trends, the ups and downs and technology evolving, defense is evolving, the attacks and threats evolving. Um, what's some of the most notable things that you've seen throughout this year that kind of probably sparked your your thoughts and, you know, that was interesting, that was unique potentially? Um, what's some of those big events that you've kind of really highlighted for you? October. 2023 hmm. we didn't celebrate but we did have the 10th anniversary of bitcoin enabled ransomware <laughs> the very Absolutely. first bitcoin enabled ransomware which we found two families hmm. in october 2013 crypto locker and crypto hmm. wall and they were the very first ones which like merged the world of mm -hmm. blockchain cryptocurrencies and ransomware and that changed everything and if you look at the last 10 years Ransomware has been the big success story for mm -hmm. the for the online criminals. Um, when you look at the so-called cybercrime unicorns or the big five yeah. ransomware gangs, the amount of money they're making is 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 massive. And we saw that, and we saw examples of that multiple times during 2023. I think the biggest case or the biggest headlines, at least, were the attack by the Alpha Gang against MGM Grand or MGM yes. Resorts. So. That includes many of the Las Vegas hotels the hackers mm -hmm. stay at when they are in, in there for Black Hat <laughs> and DEF CON. I was staying in MGM Grand just last August to, for, for Black Hat, so mm -hmm. I think they gained access to my stay data. <laughs> and, and, and that's that, that's a great example on how the world has changed. I've actually mm -hmm. used this in my talks. I, I start the talk by playing the trailer of the movie Ocean's Eleven. Uh -huh. So you have George Clooney, Brad mm -hmm. Pitt, Matt Damon, this ragtag gang of gentlemen, criminals who have this gang which breaks into the vault of Bellagio mm -hmm. and steals tens of millions in cash. And then I point out to the audience that, hey, just recently we had exactly the same casinos, mm -hmm. MGM Grand, Bellagio yeah. being targeted by criminals trying to steal tens of millions of dollars, yeah. except they were nowhere near the casinos. This is completely virtual. This mm -hmm. is the difference between good old days and where yeah. we are today. Same targets. Well, of course, one of them was a movie, but you, you get mm -hmm. the point. Yeah. The crime has changed. We've gone from local crime, which happened on location, into global crime which is completely mm -hmm. virtual and and the mgm research hit is is just one example and there's another lesson to be learned from there mm -hmm. as we learned later caesar's palace the biggest competitor yeah. to mgm grand and and bellagio in las vegas was hit um by the same gang just a couple yep. of weeks earlier and no one even noticed because apparently they paid the ransom, which was 15 million US dollars immediately. Mm -hmm. Sounds like they were ready. They had a Bitcoin wallet waiting just in case something like this happened. And when it happened, they paid it immediately and recovered without anyone noticing. We only know because of the SEC filings. And the filings and the, yeah, the disclosure yeah. requirements that they have to have uh, as yeah. part of being a, you know, a traded company in public uh, that you have to have that insight for your investors. So, yeah. And so it, it is probably the biggest um, 
case of 2023 from the size mm -hmm. of the headlines, but far from the only one. We had big cases in Europe, like the Royal Mail incident, yeah. which was one of the many, many move it cases. And, and that's a great example on how mm -hmm. the tools you use to manage your organization are one of the one of the major ways in either the uh, remote access solutions, mm -hmm. the RDP or VPN solutions you keep running, or then like enterprise level tools like move it, which continue mm -hmm. to be one of the major ways these uh, initial access brokers find ways into the targets, which they then sell to groups like like Clop, Logbit and Alpha, which do yeah. the actual ransomware deployment once they have access to the internal networks. Absolutely. And one of the things you were seeing is that, you know, to, to your point from if you, you know, you're using that reference from Motions 11 is really important because you get into is that that's a group of, of people working together, all with their own unique, very specialized skills. Mm -hmm. And in, when we look at the criminal gangs, they are in the, built of the same, even though they are not in the same location. Sometimes, they're work, sometimes they don't even know each other. Mm -hmm. They're basically having their set of skills that they basically apply to that supply chain of criminal production line. Uh, whether it's they're stealing credentials and then selling it, whether it's creating a piece of malware, a piece of uh, a, a variant of ransomware, and then making it available to another, and then ultimately you get the the one who basically puts it, the the one who puts all those pieces together and then weaponizes it and uses it, um, and that really kind of makes it difficult because when you have those people that specialized and they're really good at what they do, sometimes you know for organizations it's very difficult to defend against those types of uh, of techniques. Yeah, yeah, and this is why I. Why I talk about them as as cybercrime unicorns to make mm -hmm. a reference to unicorn companies. Like if if Lockbit would be a technology startup, at the, look at their financials. Look at how much yeah. much money they're making. Look at what, how big their revenue is. Mm -hmm. Look at how professional their operation is. If it would be a technology startup, it would be a unicorn. So these guys yeah. are are serious, and 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 I, they think that always blows people's minds when I point it out is that these mm. gangs do branding. They have yeah. names and logos and sites. Uh, and the branding reminds me of real world organized crime gangs, mm -hmm. especially gangs like motorcycle gangs, like Bandidos yeah. or Hells mm -hmm. Angels. They do branding as well. They have very recognizable yeah. brands and logos and they need a recognized brand because they need a, a scary brand that everybody respects. Like yep. you know that you don't you don't fool around with Hell's Angels. They're yeah. serious stuff. Same thing with you know Clop Lockbit or Ransom X or Black Pasta. Imagine coming to the office mm -hmm. Monday morning to realize that hey we've been hit by ransomware. Oh my god! And then oh my mm -hmm. god, it's Clop. Oh my yeah. god, it's Alpha. Because you know if you, you work have an association, the field, and you, then you know oh, it's going to be bad. Yeah, and then they also have they they want to also have the reputation of. If when you pay, you, you recover. They also sure. want to make that association that, you know, if, if it's basically just random, you don't really know who you're dealing with. Then there's always that question is, is will will the, the, the decryption key get work? Will the utility yep. work? Will it they, do they, it? They need everybody to know that they are criminals, but they are honest criminals. Yes. Yeah. They and that's that's the work. big thing. Where, and, and I think this year, one of the things I've noticed is that this year, um, it's been interesting as well to your, to your point is like, like the CISOs that we didn't know about it. Um, what I think, I think this year I've started seeing exfiltration t types of extortion mm -hmm. starting to exceed the crypting type of ransomware because again, the the criminals they they don't want to get the public visibility as well. Sometimes they want to stay stealthy, mm -hmm. and organizations, you know, if their business is not being disrupted, they're more likely to kind of work with the criminals uh, in, in some of the payment side if it's just about the extortion of data. Um, so there is some techniques that I have seen kind of starting to evolve this year. But of course, the ones that we hear about, the big ones, are always the, the encryption-based ones where the businesses come to a complete stop. Yeah, and and very big part of them are very, very mm. public. W yeah. One thing I always say to companies mm. that um, I, I talk about is to go to these sites, go and visit mm. Lockbit website or Clop or, or any of these yeah. gangs and just scroll around. Just scroll at the amount of the victims. Because very yeah. quickly you will realize that the, the list is a never-ending list of companies of all mm -hmm. sizes, from all business areas, of all types, big and small. Nothing 
prevents you mm -hmm. from getting hit. If these companies got hit, you can get hit as well. I've Absolutely. never met a company which would like assume beforehand that we are probably going to be the next victim of these gangs. Everybody assumes mm -hmm. it's not going to be them. But it really yeah. is eye-opening when they realize that the list never ends. There's hundreds and hundreds and, and, and hundreds of them. And organizations of all sizes. And I mean, it's not its not like they just go after the ones with money. It's they go after any business uh, that's connected. If you have an internet connection, you're a, a opportunistic target. Um, I've seen organizations from you know the hundreds of millions and the billions of, of size right down to uh, mid-sized companies. Uh, right down to the you know the SMB small like you know businesses with a handful of people, all organizations of all size. If you if you're doing business online uh, and you're using technology that's connected, uh, you are you know you, you have to realize that you are a potential victim, and you just have to make sure that you you're conscious of that. And when you're conscious, sometimes it will make you be more motivated to take steps to to try to reduce the risk. I agree. I've uh, used the term that it's like sh shooting a shotgun against the internet. It's hitting yeah. random targets. Absolutely. No, so it's a really good term. It's a, and I, I think one of the things, that I, I think it was your term that you mentioned recently where it was, uh, if it's smart, it's it's hackable. <laughs> I think, if, no, no. If it's, pro really like, if it's programmable, it's hackable. If it's yep. smart, it's vulnerable. If it's pro programmable, That's it's exactly, hackable. <laughs> exactly. It's a good good clarification that. So what other things, what, what other things have you seen this year? Have, you, have, you, have, have the techniques changed? Are they, are they are they kind of doing some? I mean, we have seen social engineering mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. on the uptick because, of course, that's the techniques that's you know trying to abuse humans to get around things like two FA and MFA. Uh, yeah. So there has been you know social engineering and phishing techniques. What what techniques do you th are they changing significantly? Or are they just going uh, through the same same steps? Mostly the same, but of course we've seen some variation. Late last mm -hmm. year, we started seeing some of these MFA exhaustion attacks or, or fatigue mm -hmm. attacks, trying yeah. to get people to approve multi-factor authentication simply by overflow, flooding them or, or mm -hmm. having a pretexting attacks where they portray themselves to be the tech support team and say that yeah. there's a problem with our two-factor authentication. You know, I'll, I'll turn it off. Just give me the last code. Mm -hmm. and I'll turn it off. And People fall for these. So when security gets better, the attackers figure ways around it. Mm -hmm. This has always been the game, and it will continue to be the game. We're just try, trying to throw more and more hurdles against the attackers, mm -hmm. but I don't see this game going away anytime soon. Um, one, one, one case we should talk about, which is uh, uh, unusual mm -hmm. and abnormal, is, is a case right here in Finland, which is where mm -hmm. I am, which is the Vastamo incident. Because that's... That's such a uh, highly it's, it's, unusual case, and it's it's a sad one as well because it's one of those situations where you know it's a type of data which has a long lasting impact on the victims. Yep. Um, Very and true. It's it's something that you know it's um, people who's been through trauma, people who's been through you know, disasters, and when you go to have conversations with those that's really helping you, you know those are all meant to be you know private, you know conversations in private notes that should never yep. get out. Yep. Um, so for those, of, those you, of the of the people yeah. who don't know the case, this is a hack of a private psychotherapy center mm -hmm. in Finland with 31,980 patient records getting exposed. And those right. re patient records had a full list of the sessions with, with mm -hmm. therapists and their patients. And this is the kind of health data that stays yeah explosive for a hundred years because yep. this is people discussing with the most private things with about their their bosses their spouses mm -hmm. and their children and all of this needs to be kept secret as long as anyone mentioned is alive and that means hundred years yep. and i don't really think we've really as a society or even us technologists have mm -hmm. realized what a challenge it is to keep data like medical data like this accessible encrypted mm -hmm. secured and backed up for a goddamn hundred years it's a huge challenge and here we have the prime example of what can happen when when we fail mm -hmm. now one of the things which makes the vastamo that's the name of the company the yeah. vastamo case um unusual is that the company actually went bankrupt they actually yeah. folded pretty much immediately after all of this uh, mm -hmm. became public and that's rare i mean we only have a handful of cases i've keep, been keeping tabs on this i think yeah. i have like 50 documented bankruptcies from all over the world over yeah. my career for, for 30 years 
which yep. is remarkably s small number. This is what I always mm -hmm. tell companies when I do briefings to leadership teams. I tell them that, you know, even if you get hacked real bad, your company will be fine. You will yeah. recover. Even your stock valuation will recover. It, it actually, even, will... even within two weeks, typically. You, it, it, you, typically, on fast. average, it's usually up, you know, it recovers within two weeks and sometimes even better <laughs> than it was before the true, breach. So. True, true. However, what I also mm -hmm. tell the leadership team is that your company will survive, but you will not. Like the company will recover, but the CISO will get fired. Yeah. The CIO will get fired, the CTO will get fired, the CFO might get fired, mm -hmm. the CEO might get fired. This is how I motivate them to listen to me. That you know, your yeah. company will be fine, but you won't be fine. And However, it's even moving even moving into when you're talking about that, is now is even the liability when we look at the solar winds case. Oh yeah. And the yeah. SEC uh, uh, now you know doing the uh, uh, criminal and uh, case in filing. This is where, you know, it's not just about you losing your job, but you could be personally liable from a financial impact, especially if you're a public traded company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, as you mentioned that, we also have the first documented mm. case during this year where a ransomware gang did an SEC filing on behalf of their victims, <laughs> yes. just to show the potential new victims that, you know, you know if, if you get hit by us, you should take us seriously. If you're not reporting mm -hmm. as you should be reporting, we will report you <laughs> on your behalf on your behalf <laughs> so yeah it's like a triple extortion yeah. first you get extorted for encrypting your data then for leaking your data and then for failing to report to SEC or the local um, yeah. authority whatever it might be yeah, absolutely so we continue with the the vast the the the, the, the reddit records and stuff one of the things the significant things this year is the person who was behind that eventually was uh was caught it was in spain i think it was uh in france actually in Fra yeah. in france. although uh, he, yeah. he he has been living in multiple different countries mm -hmm. in and outside of europe but he is a finnish guy um well known figure in in the, mm -hmm. uh, in, the in this area has been tried i believe twice before for different hacking purposes mm -hmm. was a member of the lizard squad which you might remember yes. six years ago um he hasn't been uh uh found guilty yet so mm -hmm. it's still, still on an ongoing criminal but, case and, yeah. but it it's it he, he he seems very likely to be the, the the right guy i uh i was part of the investigation early on i mm -hmm. had some he leaks myself linking him to the case and now that the police investigation has become public which is by the way 2200 mm -hmm. pages of, of police reports <laughs> i've now read through 1700 pages i still have 500 pages to read there's tons of things linking him to the case for example one of the virtual servers that actually had a copy mm -hmm. of the stolen sql database of the psychotherapy center was sitting on a server which was paid by the personal credit card of the Mm -hmm. alleged hacker and multiple other things linking him to the case so i i hope he gets sentenced and uh goes to jail that's yep. that's and that's these and, and unfortunately these situations are sometimes very rare because a lot of the criminal activity you, you mentioned you know that it's cross-border uh, yep. they're in other countries and in a lot of cases they are in countries where there's no extradition treaties or even that those countries don't have laws that even consider these are crimes and in um, this case, he wouldn't have been caught unless he wouldn't have made a programming mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, actually getting the syntax of the TAR command wrong as he was writing mm -hmm. a cron job script for his, his <laughs> Linux server. So what he was actually doing during the, mm -hmm. uh, the um, early stages of the uh, blackmailing case was that he tried to blackmail the psychotherapy center to pay him mm -hmm around 400,000 euros um, in exchange of mm -hmm. the patient database. When that didn't work out, he was then um, starting to publish patient records on mm -hmm. a Tor site. So he set up a Tor website running on, 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 on Tor, um, uh, uh, on a Tor server, mm -hmm. where he would initially manually publish 100 patient records a day. After a couple of days, he got tired of doing it manually, so he did a cron <laughs> job, which would run every night at 3 a.m., pick uh, mm -hmm. 100 random text files, each text file, or one text file per victim, and put them on the Tor site. The mistake he made was that when you set the working directory in the mm -hmm. Tor command, the commands you do on the command line after the change directory command are done in different folder than before it. 
So mm -hmm. he simply got the syntax wrong, which is really easy to do it with Tar. He test mm -hmm. drove the the script he wrote, which worked fine because he happened to be running it from the mm -hmm. folder where the files were. But then when he put it as a cron job, it runs as root, which means Tar was now the... taking files from the root's home directory. For his full, then... To get the full path. Yeah, That's right. And and the end result was that he published on his Tor site listing of files in the root user's home directory, including his SSH keys, his mm -hmm. command line history, his tools. And this is how police got lucky and uh, yeah. actually found the guy. If he wouldn't have done that mistake, we probably would be still searching. Yeah, that's that's actually, I mean, that's one of the things is that usually it's, it is those tiny little details of mistakes that, that ultimately results in, in, in finding uh, the attackers. And, and um, if they're continuing to do it, there's only the few that decide to completely change, you know, their, their, their techniques and, and, and don't repeat. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's good to, to hear at least some of those cases do, do come to conclusion at some point, because that one is, I, I'm, you know, it, it is devastating. And I can, yeah. you know, think about how the victims of that will, you know, continue. Thankfully, this is rare. I only know yeah. of three other cases anywhere in the world where patient data would have been used to blackmail patients themselves. Because yeah. as the yeah. which thing I think on, was the other one was in Australia, which was the the the, the Medi uh, Medibank. Medibank, yeah, that was the yeah. other one where they they targeted because because Medibank wouldn't pay up, they target the victims, <laughs> yeah. which yeah. then you get into those situations as well. What other, I mean, in, in all other areas as well, you know, how, how, how much of the supply chain is also being impacted uh, this year? Um, yep. Is that something that you're continually seeing? Are, are attackers looking to, you know, to, let's say, accelerate the ability to target victims, you know, by targeting uh, suppliers where it allows them access to, to more organizations? Is that still being a trend and, and, and something that uh, a technique? I think from cyber criminals perspective, mm -hmm. supply chain attacks continue to be opportunistic. If they have mm -hmm. a way of using something like that to get in, they know they can access a huge amount of victims at the same time. That's basically, you could say move it was a supply chain mm -hmm. attack yeah. because that tool you know, was used in enterprise clients around the world and there was no way for them to know it was vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But when you look at more specific supply chain attacks, especially planted attacks where they first gain access to the supplier to booby mm -hmm. trap the tools being used by others, those are then more likely to be governmental. So yeah, espionage, intelligence, and intelligence gathering. Exactly. That's that's yeah. very clever way of gaining access to the place where you need to be gaining access to. And you can figure out what kind of tools you would like to booby trap, mm -hmm. which would then presumably be used by the kind of uh, targets you're interested in. And that continues to be, you know, really, really problematic. How do you mm -hmm. make sure that the things you are running inside your organization are really audited properly, yeah. especially if you're faced with a, a nation state as someone who wants to attack against you? Yeah. It is, uh, it's, it's very, very tough. You're so just hoping that the motives are never... <laughs> never acted upon because <laughs> yes. that's that's the result is you know. and, and, and from my point of view there really is no no way of completely preventing this so the best mm -hmm. shot you have is to have enough capability to detect when you get hit yep. so have enough anomaly detection mm -hmm. have the capability of realizing mm -hmm. that something weird is happening in your networks and be able to raise an alarm so if you can't mm -hmm. stop it then the next best thing is to yeah. realize you have been hacked so you can respond immediately. Yeah, I think the big area as well is having that balance between being able to detect and then respond effectively. You know, not all responses are equal, and sometimes they're not all trained and simulated. So the last thing you want to be doing is, is in an active scenario. Uh, so sometimes make how you respond and, and what your recovery uh, you know, strategy is as well. Um, one thing is all as you know, with the big trend this year has been around artificial intelligence and AI sure. and the big buzzword and the trends. And, and we've seen this hype kind of, um, you know, throughout the industry, we always see these kind of like massive, you know, terms and trends. We've had zero trust. We've had, mm -hmm. you know, quantum and blockchain and, and many other and cryptocurrencies. Are, uh, and now, you know, the latest trend is around AI. Um, you know, is, is it something, you know, I mean, are criminals using, using it to their advantage? Um, is it something that we're seeing used more in attacks? And, and what's your thought around, uh, around AI in the industry today? You're absolutely right. There's tons of hype around AI, but I think the hype is warranted. 
this is not an mm -hmm. empty bubble. There might be a bubble brewing in AI. We might see a bubble per burst, but it's going to be similar to what happened with the dot-com mm -hmm. boom in 1999 and 2000. Sure, we had a huge like amount of uh, oversized expectations and the bubble bursted. But if you look at the promises people were being given in the end of 1999 about how internet is going to change the world, all of that became true. All mm -hmm. shopping did go online. Yeah. Movies did go online. We really do buy dog food online today, which, <laughs> which, which is what was promised. It just took, you know, 20 years. So AI is really changing the world. Mm -hmm. I do believe the AI revolution is a bigger revolution than the internet revolution, and that's saying something. That's a, because the that's internet a big because really, you know, it, it, it changed our lives a lot. <laughs> it did. It did, and I think AI will change world mm -hmm. more. So probably, probably more in how we work, like the workforce. I think that's probably you're absolutely right. We don't think about just as our society. I think it changes employment. Uh, the way we in, in employment happens in the future. So you're, you're absolutely, I think you're spot on there. Yeah, and industrial revolutions have typically changed the way we work more for the working class and less for the white mm -hmm. collar people. This one is exactly the other way around. AI won't change the work our um, blummer, blummers do at all. It's going to take mm -hmm. away your job and my yeah. job. And that's, um, that's going to be a different story altogether. But it, it is quite remarkable how quickly this is moving, mm -hmm. especially since we've been waiting for this revolution for decades. Yeah, like, since the 60s, I think it was. even Because yeah, yeah. then, then, then it was mostly focused around simulations and educational training uh, models. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you know, this is something that's been worked on for a long time. And now I think it's one of those things that all the things have just come at the right time. You know, it, it probably wouldn't have been successful without having the connectivity that we have today, sure. uh, the processing power that we have today, sure. uh, the data that's being collected. Sure. All of those things, I think it's one of those times it's just timing is 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 right. Yep. Um, but I think you're, you know, to your point, uh, it will probably be more over the, the 10 to 20 year time that we'll start seeing what we're talking about today become much more reality. I don't think it's going to come immediately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, one of the key issue really was that all human knowledge now is data. Yeah. Just 15, 20 years ago, a big part of human knowledge was on paper. You can't teach machines with paper. But yeah. now, obviously, all the new information we generate is data. But, but we've even gone back and digitized all the old information, which means Absolutely. you can just use it, feed it to machines. And with the computing capability we have today, you can just have mm -hmm. them read it all, read all the books, read every Finnish book and pick up the language. It's the same thing with every other language. Mm -hmm. Learn to program in any language simply by reading all the books. Yeah. And it's 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 finally doable after all this all these uh, AI winters and mm -hmm. springs and fall starts. No, it really is happening, and it's hard to keep up even if you try to. And let me mm -hmm. give a recommendation to people listening. We've all played around with uh, large language models mm -hmm. and image generators. Some of you have tried music generators. Mm -hmm. but there's one which is really blowing my mind right now. It's called Suno. That's S-U-N-O dot mm -hmm. A-I, um, which is a music generator. You write, like, give me gangster rap with big bass and a lot of <laughs> boom and large echo, and then mm. make me some lyrics and rap it, and it can mm. rap or do heavy metal or do pop singing in any language. It, it sings in your language or it raps in your language. And it's well, surprisingly impressive. good. It is. Try it. You will be uh, amazed. In fact, I'm actually, should, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be making some, some songs. <laughs> later this you this should evening. make a song and you should include it in this episode in yeah. the end so people have an idea about well, what it sounds well, like. I'm going to take the transcript. <laughs> and, you should. You know what? Both of us will be doing, being, doing a duet. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I, I already regret bringing this up, but I think it's a great example on how fast this is moving because mm -hmm. I was looking at music generators three months ago, and in just three months they've mm -hmm. changed so much. The thing, Suno creates songs that I wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, be surprised to hear from the radio. They're, they're so, perfectly so. Fine. A question, a question on this. One of the things, as I always get, is, is, as I remember, one at the Talent Digital Summit this year, uh, one of the things that was, you know, they they get up and they announce is that. The, this images was done with AI and this, you know, choreography, the music, everything was AI. And I'm, I'm going, I always felt that, you know, at the end, some developer sitting there who wrote the algorithm that was used to create it, 
how, what does accountability come here? <laughs> you know, can you just say it was the AI's fault, it wasn't mine? <laughs> and then the developer's going, well, I, put, I wrote the algorithm, it's, it's the AI's fault, it's not mine. Yeah. What is, where does accountability come in this area? Like, uh, yeah. Are we just trying to dis, disassociate decision making from away from humans? Uh, I mean, where does, it, where does this come? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, this is a very tough question. And, and European Union is trying to answer mm -hmm. some of these tough questions in, with the AI Act. And that's yes. a really hard thing to do. AI Act uh, is trying to solve tons of different problems related to mm -hmm. AI in general, including copyright, trademark, safety, mm -hmm. security, and uh, you know the responsibility question. Yep. Um, from my point of view, when we make real world decision or decisions mm -hmm. based on, on, on machine learning, who really is responsible? Clearly it can't be the, the algorithm, it has to be a human. So yeah. then the question becomes, is it the programmer inside the organization? Is it the programming team? Is it the R&D unit? Mm -hmm. Is it the CEO? Is it the leadership team or is it the board of the company? Like wh where do yeah, we put the under? responsibility? Yeah. And, 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 and most companies have no idea. They've never even thought about this. Now, mm -hmm. We write code for self-driving cars. If the car kills someone, is it the responsibility of the programmer or the chairman of the board? Mm -hmm. Great question. No, I don't have an answer for it, but it's a great question. Yeah, I think it's something that you know. Eventually, one one incidents do happen, there will be you know those discussions will probably you know really uh, choose some of the direction. I get also just kind of finally one of the things I want to get is that you know for the for for the future moving forward, where do you see kind of in, let's say in twenty twenty four and beyond, where do you see kind of the direction of this going? What what do you think is is going to be the outcome? Are we going to see this battle of AIs um, happening? Is, is that yes, something that's absolutely <laughs> yes? It sounds like science fiction. That's exactly yeah. what we're going to see. We will mm -hmm. see good AI versus bad AI. Now, mm -hmm. from my point of view, if you look at things, um, these different Gen AI algorithms mm -hmm. will 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 uh, be causing problems with as regards to cybersecurity. Some of them are pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, Deepfakes, sure, will be used yeah. in scams. We already see that in small scale, not in huge scale, but they already exist. I have examples mm -hmm. of, of deepfakes being used to scam people. Um, then we will see more, um, not deepfakes, but let's say deep scams, let's say mm -hmm. romance scams or BEC scams yeah. done in massive parallel capabilities, fooling 10,000 victims at the same time across all language barriers. This seems to be starting already. Um, yeah, I think I, in India was the big one recently where it was mm -hmm. the... Uh, uh, the, the, the the trouble scam. You know, that yep. was the one I think. Uh, uh, was it uh, 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 Darknet Diaries was covering the episode there, which was really interesting about you know how big that was about getting yep. you know, and it was it was kind of accelerating in India. Yep. And if you, for example, romance scam, which is a huge problem, probably one of the biggest mm -hmm. problems for consumers is is uh, auction scams, Airbnb scams, mm -hmm. and and investment scams, and yep. romance scams. One romance scammer right now fools maybe three or four victims at the same time. Typically in languages, he, mm -hmm. he can understand at least to some level. With automation, one scammer can scam ten thousand victims at the same time in all languages, and it's going to be perfect. So yeah. this this is the, the problem. So scaling. Deepfakes, this is the yeah, scaling. It, it it scales the 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 crime to astronomical to to unthinkable you know possibilities, yep. Um, yep. and that's a scary thought. It is. I've actually discussed this with with um, people at OpenAI about how mm -hmm. they could limit this. It's 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 a hard problem. We don't have an easy solution for that either. Yep. But if you look at the other things which will be happening with Gen AI beyond deep fakes and deep scams, then we will have malware written by mm -hmm. uh, large language models. We yep. so far have three examples. Um, AI will be able to find vulnerabilities, which is mm -hmm. great when you're trying to find zero yep. days in your own code. It's awful when someone else is trying to find zero days in your code. And then we will see complete automation of malware campaigns. Yeah. So right now, defenders like, like we at WitSecure, we've automated everything. Mm -hmm. We are very fast in finding and reacting to new attacks. The attackers are still working manually. They yes. are reacting at human speed to the mm -hmm. things our defense systems do at machine speed, and that will change. And we know it hasn't changed mm -hmm. yet because they are still slow, but that's gonna change. Sure 
anytime. It could have changed already. It yeah. simply hasn't. And then when that happens, then we really will see which one will be faster, good AI or bad AI. We will have, mm -hmm. I don't know, a ransomware campaign run completely hands-free, hand which will automatically set up new CNC servers, register new yeah. domains, rewrite the emails, recompile the binaries. And do it and, and in, in real time. That's in the, real that's, time. That's the worry for me is that if all of a sudden the the malware is basically it, it's modifying itself in real time to evade detection and yep. and to to get around the techniques. I and hate the you, way you think. <laughs> and then and then when you think about it, it gets into the collective, the Borg scenario where you know it's all working together. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, this it really gets to a point where you know we really need to make sure we, we keep ahead. Um, and we're always advancing. Um, it's no, no time to be complacent, I would say. There is still job security in cybersecurity. <laughs> yeah, it just, it, what we do in the techniques will, will evolve and change. Uh, we won't keep doing the same thing. And that's always been the case. I mean, I, if, if I think about my career over the, over the years, every five years, uh, I have to, to modify you know, and, and change. Um, and adapt, um, and that's something I think we're going to continue having to do anyway. And 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 that's great. After 32 years mm. in the industry, I haven't had a boring day yet. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. That it's it's always great to hear uh, because that's uh, for me absolutely. It's always been exciting. And uh, as I approach uh, similar similar years in the industry, uh, I, I, that means that I'm I'm hopeful that uh, I will continue enjoying what I do. <laughs> so, as as you do yourself. Uh, Miko, it's been amazing having you on. I always Thank enjoy you. talking to you. Hopefully, we'll get to catch up again in, per, uh, in, in, in person. Um, I'm pretty sure it won't be long because we're we're such uh, close neighbors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, That's right. That's right. Um, but it's been awesome. Any any final words of wisdom or thoughts for the audience uh, before we finish up today? Well, one thing I always like to do is thank people for their work. Mm -hmm. Those of you who work in cybersecurity, people don't see your work because when cybersecurity works mm -hmm. nothing happens so thank you for your work thank you for working making the world a safer place thank you absolutely so what very wise words and and i couldn't you know really it's it's absolutely you know when when things don't happen we know that you know things are you know security is working and that's always a great thing to hear miko it's been amazing having you on um i'll definitely make sure that the audience get uh, you know we make sure we put a link to the book uh, in the show notes and uh have have a safe and great holidays and uh, and enjoy enjoy your break. Uh, make sure you have a have a great time. So thank you, all the best. You. And for everyone, this is the Four One Access Tonight podcast. Tune in every, every two weeks, and uh, you'll get the latest updates and trends and and from amazing uh, guests such as Miko.